the time now has come and that we're able to start this month's webinar. So I'd like to say hello to everyone who's out there listening to us today. My name is Abby Bauer and I'm an associate editor for Horde Steerman Magazine. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, which is brought to you by the team here at Horde Steerman and the University of Illinois. Some of our behind the scenes folks are Jim Baltz, who works down at the University of Illinois, and Patty Hurchin, who is our online media manager. And they're the ones that pull together a lot of the um, background information and the work that happens beforehand so that these webinars can go off smoothly every month. So we surely appreciate the work that they do. Um, as always, I have the honor of co-hosting these webinars with Mike Hutchins, the well-known and well-respected um, professor emeritus from the University of Illinois. And today it's our pleasure to welcome our speaker, Lindsay Ferlito, who is with Cornell University Cooperative Extension. Lindsay is going to highlight some data that her and her teammates collected on dairy farms um, during the presentation today, which is titled Monitoring and Improving Cow Comfort in Free Stalls and Tie Stalls. Mike, please take it from here to further introduce Lindsay and start off this month's webinar. Well, very good, Abby. It's my uh, professional and personal uh, pleasure to introduce Lindsay. Uh, she was uh, raised and born outside of Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada and received her bachelor's and master's degree from the University of BC and their animal welfare program systems team. In the next five years, she worked primarily with the Novus Cows, that's C period, O-W, uh, w, uh, Cows, the period is behind there. And that basically is a program that conducts on-farm uh, comfort uh, assessments as far as that goes. And then Cornell University was fortunate to attract her in 2016 as part of their North Country Regional Ag Team. And there she also continues her work on cow comfort, lameness, behavior, and, and materials she'll cover here today. So Lindsay, we're very pleased to have you on board. We'll turn the program over to you. Great, thank you. As Mike mentioned, we're going to be talking about um, improving cow comfort in free stalls and tie stalls. Um, I'm based out of northern New York, and so we still have quite a few tie stalls up here, um, and as well as obviously free stalls. Um, and it's pretty similar in a lot of counties around New York. So we wanted to collect some data um, and be able to give our farmers feedback on how they're doing. So I'm going to walk through some of that data today, as well as touching on some, some data from previous research. So we're going to talk about the importance of monitoring cow comfort um, and mention the data from two studies that I've done up here and obviously bring in that link to profitability because, um, you know, farmers always have to be thinking about that aspect of things. Um, then I'm going to give some feedback from what producers are saying um, and end with some case study herds. So some real world examples of what farmers are doing um, and how they're having success. So how do we monitor cow comfort? That's going to be, you know, the first step we have to determine that in order to, to start measuring it. And historically, a lot of times we focused on health and production, um, but we really need to be looking at a bigger picture and really taking into consideration a bunch of different factors um, and how the environment and our management is impacting this cow. So obviously production and health are going to be key components of that. But looking at those management factors like stocking density, feed bunk space, competition, um, how is it impacting the cow? So is she able to lay down? How long? Uh, does she have any injuries? And is she lame? So these are just some of the things we're going to look at um, as we go through today. Now we have our first question, our first question, so get ready to do the polling. How often do you or the dairies you work with monitor and uh, measure uh, cow comfort, such things as lameness, uh, scoring, uh, injury scoring, barn assessments, etc. And you have five choices. So here we go. The first one is weekly, monthly, yearly, only when necessary, your fourth choice, and of course, the last choice is never. So we're off and running here, and we're getting pretty aggressive votes. Uh, Abby, are you going to vote on this one? I think this one is more probably just to figure out what the audience is doing. Um, and I think you know, I think more often is probably better. It's, I doubt if it's something that everyone is doing on a weekly basis, but with some of the programs like the farm program or some of the milk milk hauling or milk processing plants that maybe require people to be more aware of these this area now, um, people might be doing it more often than they used to be. So yeah. we'll see what people say. Yeah, I'm going to vote for monthly. If I was going to vote, I'd vote monthly, but I can't vote. And Jim, we've got 65% in, so let's uh, close the polls. And Jim's going to post the answer here. And Lindsay, what do you think of these answers? 
I think it's awesome that there's 21% that are doing it weekly. I didn't think that would come up. Um, I'm not surprised to see that the, the majority would be only when necessary. Um, and as Abby mentioned, they're probably more for um, like a farm evaluation or some sort of co-op um, requirement. Um, but it's it's really promising to see that, you know, half are at least doing it on a yearly basis. Um, so we'll we'll walk through some data and some examples of, of how doing it regularly um, is really gonna be key. So the importance of actually going out there and measuring cow comfort, um, you know, obviously a, a good manager, a good herds person, or, you know, a good consultant that works with dairies is gonna be able to walk on a farm and tell, kind of get that feeling of, are these cows comfortable, are they not? But at the same time, we do wanna have those actual numbers and be able to quantify things. So obviously looking at those pictures on the left, you know, these girls have access to feed bunk, they're, they're eating, there's feed in front of them. This girl's clearly comfortable enough that she almost looks like maybe she should be checked because she's so, she's so passed out. Um, these girls have plenty of space, stocking density is super low in this pen, um, and yet they're still choosing to lay together. But then you have these examples of these cows are telling us something else. So, you know, this girl somehow got injured in her pen or somewhere in the barn. She's trying to tell us something. This cow clearly is unhappy with the environment we're providing with her. Um, but why? What's wrong with that? Other cows are fitting in the stalls, but what is she telling us? So actually measuring these things so we really understand um, what's impacting cow comfort and how we're doing. So if you can't, everyone always says, if you can't, uh, you can't manage it if you don't monitor it. So a lot of times producers, uh, when we talk to them, you know, one example was uh, we asked a farmer if they thought that lameness was a problem on their herd before we did an assessment. Um, and their response was, nope, it's not a problem, we're fine. Then we did the assessment, uh, gave them their, their data and showed them how they compare to a regional benchmark and they were actually much worse than the regional benchmark. And they just had no idea because they see those cows every day, that idea of barn blindness, you just get used to it. If half of your cows are lame, that does become normal on your farm. So it's harder to kind of see that that's not where you're supposed to be. Um, other times farmers say, you know, I can't afford to make changes. So, you know, even if I, even if I had bad lameness, what am I gonna do about it? And so we'll give some examples today of, of things that don't cost a lot of money, um, but that can still have a positive impact on lameness and cow comfort. Or that example of, oh, that cow has always been stiff. She's, she always walks like that. Um, and yes, there are cases like that, but sometimes there actually is something going on um, that's creating that problem and just taking a look at things and seeing if there is something we can address. So being able to measure cow comfort, give producers feedback on how they're doing. Um, we are gonna talk about some benchmarks, looking at how those farms compare to others in their area, but ultimately too, how do they compare to themselves? So benchmarking against themselves, doing an assessment, they make a change, come back, do another assessment. Did it uh, address the problems? If not, what else do we have to do? What's promising is that actually monitoring cow comfort can help. So giving producers feedback on how they're doing, working with them, trying to address those issues, uh, making changes big or small can have a positive impact. So this is data uh, from Novus, from that cows program that Mike mentioned. Um, and what happened was uh, an assessment was done on these farms. The producers were given a report, shown how they were doing individually for things like lameness, uh, hawk injuries, knee injuries, lying time. And they also saw how they compared to a regional benchmark. So uh, Northeast US, California, uh, Midwest, and then the farms were, were left to do with that what they wanted. And a lot of farms did make changes. So we came back, um, you know, anywhere from six months to a couple years later and did a reassessment on that same pen. Um, this would be just the main high production pen. And so what you can see is the original assessment is the open circles. Um, and on the left, we have the, the lameness. And on the right, we have hawk injuries. And then the reassessment is that black dot. So you can see for almost all of them, with the exception of maybe one or two, they improved for that reassessment. And in some cases there was drastic improvements. So hawk injuries going from 90% down to 10% um, or lameness going from 50% down to 10%. So huge improvement seen. So I take that as a real positive um, given that I work with farmers and one of the things I like to do is cow comfort assessments and, and give them this information. So it is really important to be monitoring that and giving producers feedback on how they're doing. So the first study is looking at lying time and lameness on tie stall dairies in New York. So we wanted to determine the lameness prevalence on local tie stall herds and try to track some success stories and link it back to facility and management factors and basically give producers feedback on how they're doing 
how they're doing compared to their peers um, and maybe generate some some feedback and sharing of of what's worked, what hasn't worked. So this group was uh, 22 tie stall dairies averaging about 70 lactating cows and about 65 pounds a day. And we did an assessment of 40 lactating animals per herd and we looked at housing factors, so stall base, uh, stall size, as well as management factors, so bedding, whether or not they had access to pasture. We also looked at the cow and measured um, hawk, knee, and neck injuries, as well as lameness. And then also looked at hygiene, body condition score, lying behavior, and cow size. And then producers were given a report uh, summarizing all these things for their own farm and then comparing them to that benchmark. The second study, um, and both of these studies were funded by the, the New York Farm Viability Institute. Um, this one was similar, but we focused on freestyle dairies and we wanted to help farms prepare for um, the National Farm Program Evaluation. So when we started this project, uh, it was in earlier 2017, which is when version 3.0 just came out. And a lot of our dairies um, didn't have a lot of information on the program and weren't sure you know, how they would do and wanted a bit more information. So we decided to kind of do mock evaluations um, and just work with those farms and give them some feedback. Oh, sorry, I'll go back one. So this, this data set was 31 free stalls in Northern New York. Um, and the herd size obviously is a lot higher than the tie stall herd size. So this one averaging about 915 lactating and dry cows. So for this one, we did an evaluation similar to the farm program. Um, the farm program uses an algorithm to determine how many animals to score based on the herd size. So on some herds, we looked at uh, 100 animals, but the smallest herd uh, was only 29 animals. So on, on every herd, there was at least 29 lactating or dry cows that were assessed. Um, and again, we looked at kind of general management and facility observations. So um, made any notes of anything that looked um, out of the ordinary or that could be impacting cow comfort. And then we really just focused on those cow outcomes. So hawk and knee injuries. Um, and for the farm program, they they score the cow and give her one score based on her hawks and her knees. And I'll go through that again when we look at the results. And then lameness scoring, hygiene, and body condition. And again, producers received a report with their own data and how they compared to the 31 herd freestyle group off and running here comes the important question abby get get your pencil sharpened up here uh voters uh what is the acceptable level of lameness prevalence on a herd and we have four choices here so we should be able to get one of the four right hopefully uh greater than what is now remember acceptable level of lameness uh, greater than the 30 percent 20 to 30 percent 10 to 20 percent or zero so this will be interesting to see where it comes out and um Abby, uh, are you going to vote? Ooh, that's tough. I would say zero is what you would want and that we wouldn't have any lameness, but is can herds get down to zero? I think they can, but could be difficult. So I, I guess I will pick the 10 to 20%. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would go with, I, I, I'm kind of like, you. Yeah, I, I don't know if Lindsay's trying to trick me up or not. That's what's really <laughs> making me nervous here. And then, of course, we haven't defined what's lameness. You know, is that a cow that's limping or or is, or is that a cow that's stiff or whatever the case is? So I, um, I'll i be devil's advocate. I'll go for zero. I, th I think that'd be very acceptable, zero. Uh, we are at 72%. So let's go and close the poll, Jim. And uh, Lindsay, uh, what do you think of these answers? Fantastic. Yeah. And as you said, I did try to purposely put this ahead of talking about any of the results or what lameness actually is, because that's that's going to be our, you know, our next slide or the slide after that is what do we mean by lameness, first of all, because not everyone, um, you know, thinks that means the same thing. Um, as Abby said, yeah, zero percent should be our ultimate, you know, gold standard. Obviously, we would like to have no animals that are lame. Um, and I also purposely didn't put in five percent which is the, the National Farm Program target, because I wanted to see, I didn't want people just to pick that. Um, but so I think it's promising that we're, we're definitely, you know, aiming to be the best we can be, trying to get down to zero, um, but recognizing it is extremely challenging. And we know that, that, that not all farms are, are close to that. So as I mentioned, the National Farm Program, their target is less than 5% 
of the lactating and dry cow herd scored as severely lame. Um, and my next slide, we're going to talk about the difference between mild lameness and severe lameness. From previous studies, uh, industry averages for tie stalls ranges anywhere from 15% to 25%, um, depending on you know what study it is and what region of the world is what region of the world it is. For free stalls, it's pretty similar. Um, some work out of Wisconsin found as low as 11%, whereas other studies um, looking at the rest of the U.S. found as high as 31%. But we do really also have to be asking ourselves, what does a consumer think? So if you were to, you know, go to a store, talk to someone at Walmart buying milk and tell them that on average, 25% of our lactating cows have trouble walking, is that a number that we think the average consumer is going to be okay with? Um, and so I do think we always just need to be reminding ourselves that we're, you know, produ producers don't need to be reminded, but there's more and more scrutiny and people are asking questions, but just keeping that in our minds of, of how, how low can we get this number? Because I do really think the average consumer would not be okay if we showed them this slide. Um, but what's promising is that we'll walk through some data and show how ind individual farms are doing a really good job um, and the steps that they're taking to better themselves and, and how the, the dairy industry is trying to improve and get that number lower. So for scoring lameness, um, there's you know, a common five point scoring system that can kind of then be summarized into three points. So she's either sound, so she's walking nicely, there's no issues, mild lameness, and this video is definitely more of a, uh, definitely on the worst end of the mild lameness, she could look a little bit better than that and still be considered mild lame. But essentially, you know, she might have an arched back, but she's not bobbing her head. She doesn't have an, uh, a real obvious limp. It takes you know, some looking at her to realize that she's not tracking up, that she does have some asymmetric gait. And then, you know, our worst case scenario is that severely lame cow. It doesn't take, uh, you know, anyone who's worked in the industry to see that that animal is lame. She has problems walking. She's bobbing her head. She's arching her back. Uh, she can't put weight on that foot. So um, the next few graphs are going to be lots of numbers and colors, but I'll walk you through them. So we're going to get into the results now of the studies. So this is looking at lameness. Um, the top is the freestall data, and then the bottom half is the tie stall data. Um, what it's showing is the green bars is the sound animals, so we want to see that number being higher. And then the orange color is the mild lameness, and the red color is severe. So for the freestalls, on average, about 23% of the cows scored were mildly lame, and 4% were severely lame. And for the tie stalls, 18% on average were mildly lame, and about 2.5% were severely lame. So in terms of reaching that farm program target, um, a 5% being, or less than 5% being severely lame, in both of these examples, we are meeting it. Um, but as you can see, and we've seen this in other studies, this isn't a huge surprise, there's a huge variation from farm to farm. Um, so in some cases, we have farms that have, you know, 2.5% lameness, and then we have a farm that has 40% lameness. Same with the severe. We have a farm that has no severely lame animals, and then a farm that has 21% of the animals scored uh, that were severely lame. So really indicating it does need to be an individual farm thing. Farms do need to look at this um, on their own farms, actually be measuring this, seeing where they are, and then seeing how they can improve. For the hawk scoring, uh, we use the, the chart from Cornell. It's a three-point scoring system, a score of one. Uh, it's sound, there's no injuries, nothing, nothing wrong. A score of two, we call the mild injury. So that's mainly just hair loss. Um, and then a score of three would be considered a severe injury. That's when you've got uh, obvious swelling or there's some sort of cut or lesion, um, blood or pus. And then for scoring knees, uh, similar, similar scoring uh, sound or a one is no hair loss, uh, a mild injury is hair loss and then a severe injury would be again obvious swelling or some sort of injury or lesion. And then for the tie stalls we also looked at neck injuries same scoring system a sound is fine mild injury there is hair loss and then a severe injury um, with again obvious swelling or some sort of lesion 
Um, sometimes we'd see a scab or something. So um, this is where it's going to differ a little bit between the free stalls and the tie stalls. So for the free stalls, we follow the, the farm program scoring where they looked at one animal and then gave her one score based on her hawks or her knees. So if she had um, a hawk injury or a knee injury, um, whether she had both or not, if she had one, then she she's gets that score. Um, and then you go with the most severe score. So this is hawk and knee injuries combined. Um, and on average, we found um, that about 28% of the cows that we scored in the lactating and dry herd had some form of hawk or knee injury. So in this case, this was um, mild injury, so they had hair loss. 7% had a severe injury. And again, a huge range. So we had farms that basically had no severe injuries, all the way up to farms where almost every animal um, had some sort of swelling and lesion. So really indicating that there are individual farms on this end that need to be doing some work to determine what is causing those injuries and how you can improve them. For the tie stalls, we looked at these individually. Um, so we looked at the hawks separately, we looked at the knees, and we looked at the necks. So that's what this is showing. Um, and the only difference too is that for the knees, we just looked at sound or injury. So we didn't measure hair loss on the knees. So for the tie stall herds, on average, about half had some form of hair loss on their hawk, and about seven and a half percent had a severe injury, so a swollen hawk or an injured hawk. And again, a huge range between herds. For the knee injuries, on average, about 6% of the herds had uh, cows that had some sort of injured knee, so swelling or a lesion. And for the necks, 18% had some form of hair loss on the neck, and about 6.5% of the herds had a severe neck injury, so swelling or a lesion. And again, that big range between herds were basically non-existent on some herds all the way up to half the cows had, had a pretty severe neck injury. For the tie stalls, we also were able to measure the individual cows and their stall. Um, and we know that that does have a huge impact on injuries and comfort and obviously her ability to use that stall. So what this graph is showing or what this chart is showing us is um, the herd averages and then the minimum and maximum. And these first two are the cow measurements. So we measured her rump height and her hook width. And we used um, measures our uh, scoring systems from previous research um, and recommendations from previous research that'll be shown on the next slide. So we have our actual cow measurements um, and then the actual stalls that she's in. So this is, you know, stall length, the width of the stall, this is all in inches, the tie rail height, the position of the tie rail. So that is, um, if it was zero, that indicates that the tie rail is positioned. Um, so you can see on here, that would be your tie rail. So if it was zero, that means your tie rail is attached right above your manger curb. Um, and we wanna see that tie rail moved forward if possible to give that cow more usable space at the front of that stall. Um, tie chain length, and then the manger curb height, and then the space over the water um, indicates the amount of space that cow has um, if she has her head over the water before she would hit something. So you know, 20 inches indicates that there was some sort of pipe or something above that water um, that was obstructing her to some degree. And again, we're seeing big ranges. We, we saw huge ranges in cow size, um, you know, from the herd average of 52 up to 62. So we had herds that had cows that were 10 inches taller than other herds. So obviously their stalls need to be much bigger. So now I've added in that recommendation um, from previous studies. And then we determined whether or not on average um, the, free, the tie stalls were big enough for, for the cows that they were housing. Um, and ultimately what we found was they were not. Um, not a huge surprise. Our, you know, our stalls have not gotten uh, a lot bigger. They haven't, you know, really changed, whereas our cows have gotten a lot bigger. So um, the recommendation for stall length, uh, on average, that was not met. Stalls were too short for the cows. Um, what was met was the recommendation for width. So that was nice to see. On average, the stalls were wide enough. 
the tie rail height was not high enough. Um, it was not moved enough forward in the stall. The chain length was too short. They did meet the average uh, or the recommendation for manger curb height. It was less than eight inches. We don't want it being too aggressive, too high. Um, and ideally the space of the water would be greater than 30 inches. What I always preface when I, when I show this um, chart, especially to producers, it's really easy for me to sit here, especially because I'm behind a computer screen right now, but it's really easy to sit here and say, you know, this is, this is where you should be. These are the, the stall sizes that you should have. This is the ideal. This is what we know from previous research that has been linked to better cow comfort. So this is what we should be working towards, but recognizing that your cows are individuals. Your barn is different than, you know, your neighbor's barn. We have to make, make it work in your barn. So obviously if you have a crazy first lactation heifer, you don't need to give her a really long tie chain. You shorten her tie chain. Or if she's in heat, shorten her tie chain. So just reckon, recognizing these are the ideals. This is what we want to be working towards because we know we're not there yet. But then knowing that, you know, it may not work in your specific barn with your cows, but at least let's see if we can get closer to these recommended. Because in our study, what we saw out of those 22 herds was that only two came close to meeting the tie rail height recommendation. Uh, only two had met the recommendation for tie rail position and only seven herds had stalls that were long enough and wide enough. And no herd out of the 22 met all of the size recommendations. Um, so like I said, we're just not quite there. Most herds have room to improve um, in terms of stall size and, and better stall design to improve cow comfort. So I just wanna to touch on, we know that there's obviously a huge impact of the management and facilities on cow comfort. And this is just a few of the key things that have been found um, from previous studies. So lameness, unfortunately, almost everything you do <laughs> is gonna be linked to lameness. So um, the type of stall base you have, the bedding, um, stocking density, whether or not you have access to pasture, cleanliness, and that could be both in the stall and the alleyways, um, foot bath and trimming frequencies, and then for injuries, hawks are going to be linked to stall base and bedding, um, even a tie, lane chain, tie chain length in a tie stall. Um, knee injuries, again, going back to that, those stall dimensions, so length and, and tie rail position. And neck injuries would be tie chain length. And then obviously that neck rail or tie rail position, because that's what she's going to be hitting her neck against. And then lying time. Um, I didn't show the data for the lying time because I didn't measure it in the free stalls, but we did measure it in the tie stalls. Um, you know, the stall is going to be the big thing that's impacting that. So the stall base, the bedding, stocking density, you know, can she get into a stall? And then whether or not she has access to pasture and temperature. So is it, you know, the middle of August or is it December? So knowing that all of these things are going to be playing a role um, gives us a, you know, a ton of places that we can look at to address these things but trying to figure out what things really should you be addressing. Um, and I really want to drive home that it is important to be doing this. So a lot of producers know, you know, if my cows are more comfortable, they make more milk. Um, but just in case there was somebody out there that didn't think that yet, um, good cow comfort is going to pay. So having good housing and good management, so properly designed stalls, a good amount of bedding is going to lead to improved cow comfort. Um, and we know that leads to improved productivity increase longevity, um, so cows are going to stay in your herd longer, and that will lead to improved profitability on, on the farm. So when producers are talking about not having money to make changes, I totally understand, but trying to figure out if there's any way that we can make improvements, because those improvements should ultimately then lead to um, money back. And so just some examples from other studies of how it actually does pay. Um, this is data from Rick Grant out of the Minor Institute, um, essentially showing the resting time for individual cows compared to her milk production. Um, and they found on average, if you got cows to lay down for about an hour longer, it translated to two to three and a half pounds more milk. This obviously isn't gonna be the case in every scenario, um, but in is that theme of if we can get our cows laying down, resting, doing what she's supposed to do, she's just gonna be more productive. And we're gonna actually be able to measure that. And just some more proof, this is some recent data out of a, a big survey of 100 Canadian freestyle or tie style farms. Um, and they looked at 
all of these cow comfort factors. So injuries, lameness, um, and then related it to facility factors like stalls and management. And then they also looked at a bunch of different measures of profitability on the farm. Um, and they were able to find statistically significant associations. And so in this data set, they found that higher average daily lying time and a higher percentage of cows that fit into the stall, so specifically the tie rail, that was associated with increased average milk production. Not a huge surprise. They also found that higher average daily lying time and a higher percentage of clean and dry stalls and uh, frequency of scheduled hoof trimming visits was associated with higher yearly margin per cow um, calculated over replacement costs. So yes, those cows are more comfortable, they're making more milk, and those dairies are actually making more money. So as the scientist, it's always fun to show the data and the numbers and know, yes, this stuff actually matters. In some cases, you know, lameness actually is a problem. Um, but ultimately, a lot of times producers say, yeah, that's great. But what do other farms say? What are they doing? What's happening on individual dairies? Because I want to know that. So what are, what are individual producers saying? Was it useful to assess cow comfort on your farm? Sure. It was a good comparison to other farms. Uh, one producer said he even showed his banker because uh, he wanted his banker to know how well he was doing and that he was taking good care of his cows. Um, one herd said, yes, it was good to confirm that they do need to put in the time and the money to renovate the rest of their stalls. Um, one farm said they appreciated having me come in to give an unbiased evaluation. Um, working for Extension, I'm just coming in and giving producers information. Um, so giving them a report, showing them how they can measure progress, make improvements, um, and, and work towards, especially to meeting the, the farm program requirements. Um, and then one herd we looked at, looked at um, their behavior on pasture too and how they laid down in the stalls. And so that was interesting. So farmers do, when they're given this information, they do find it useful. And as we've mentioned, I know that barn renovations can be expensive and I'm not saying everyone should go out and re redesign their barn if their stalls are too small. Um, but I'm gonna show some examples where not all changes have to cost a lot of money. Um, we did have farms that did build a new barn. Um, and then we had farms that made a lot smaller changes, a lot lower investment, um, and still saw measurable improvements. Um, some of the examples, looking at management changes. So in one case, um, a herd was able to identify lame cows earlier. So we came on the herd, or we came on the farm, we did a lameness assessment, and he said, you called that cow lame? He said, yes. Um, and he goes, she's lame. And so my coworker brought that cow, you know, they brought that cow back around and she showed that producer, these are the things that I'm picking up. Yes, that cow is mildly lame. Um, and sure enough, within a week or so, he called back and said that she was now severely lame. And so knowing how to pick her up earlier, um, he can treat them earlier, try to figure out what's going on. And that's obviously going to cost him a lot less money in the long run. Um, other farms added more bedding. And then in some cases, there, there was facility changes. So making stalls larger to meet the required dimensions, um, lengthening the tie chain, for especially for individual animals, so those bigger cows, um, replacing stall mattresses, and adding additional fans or sprinklers. So I'm going to just walk through uh, six case studies now of, of real examples of either tie stalls or free stall farms that made changes um, and, and what they saw. So this first example was part of our tie stall study. Um, they have about 65 cows and their cows go out to pasture at night uh, during the, the grazing season in New York. So anytime from about May to October, if we're lucky. Um, and they had already retrofitted half of their barn. Um, they did most of the work themselves and it was, it was a lot of work. Um, and they had done half the barn and really wanted to know, was, was that the right changes to make? Um, it's a lot of work and time. Is it really worth retrofitting the rest of the barn? Um, and they actually had some of the biggest cows. So they, you know, they kind of had a hunch they should, but they wanted that extra little bit of data before they, they went through it. And so what we found was um, they actually did have pretty good size stalls. So they did have uh, cows on the larger side. So again, this is their cow size for the herd. And then this is showing their individual um, animals. And you can see now we're seeing a lot more of the yellow and green, which means that we're meeting or getting very close to meeting the recommendations. Um, so they were one of only eight of the herds that was close to meeting the requirement for stall length. 
and one of only seven herds that met for both length and width. Um, and this herd was one of the best herds for lameness. So we did two assessments there. Um, and one time they're about two and a half percent and one time they're about five and a half percent. So scoring really well um, in terms of lameness. They were curious to know how their stalls were actually working. So in this case, looking at that line behavior data, um, what this is showing us is for each hour of the day, how many minutes of that hour is she laying, or are the cows laying down? So if it was 60, that meant they spent the whole hour laying down. Um, and so there, the farm data is in yellow, and then the benchmark showing the 22 tie stall herds is in blue. Um, and it's you know pretty common to see a lot of lying time overnight. Obviously, cows like to lay down a lot overnight, and then they tend to be a lot more active around dawn. Also, farm chores tend to happen around that time. Um, and then we see, depending on the situation, a little bit less lying time during the day. Again, peak activity kind of around dusk, again, when farm chores usually are happening in tie stall, and then the lying time increases overnight. So in this case, these cows had access to pasture overnight. So in the farmer's mind, if she saw a bunch of lying time overnight and none during the day, that was her cow's way of saying, we don't like the stalls. We're waiting till overnight till we're out on pasture to lay down. But what we actually saw was a, a good amount of lying time at night. Um, and they were getting fed uh, a good diet indoors. So they were not having to rely on, you know, strictly grazing. So when the cows went out to pasture at night, they could kind of do what they wanted. Um, and so they chose to graze and roam around. And then when they came in during the day, when they were done milking, they laid down. So that told the farmer, yeah, your stalls are good. Your cows like them. Um, it is worth renovating those stalls. And actually, she just called me about a week ago and they have decided to renovate the other half of the stalls. So that's really exciting. In this example, this is a free stall, um, and I did two assessments here about two years apart, um, looking at hawk injuries and lameness. So we saw a big decrease in hawk injuries overall, um, but we actually saw a slight increase in, in lameness. So in this herd, um, they became, they had better bedding management. Um, they more consistently were adding sand to those stalls. They were having trouble getting it at the beginning, um, closer to 2017. So they were adding sand more consistently. They had improved ventilation and added fans, but they had also increased their stocking density. So they were growing. And so when I was first there, they were pretty um, understocked, especially for, for New York. Um, and when I came back, they were now technically overstocked, um, especially at the feed bunk. And the amount of time they were spending out of the pen in the parlor was a lot higher. So in this example, we had, you know, some improvements in hawk injuries from that extra bedding, but we had many changes happening at once. And some of those changes were not all positive. Um, so we need to get that whole story and look at all those factors. So if we just looked at hawk injuries, we would have said, yeah, this is great. Um, but this is a good example of why it's important to be looking at multiple factors to be tracking, because obviously, on a farm, they don't usually make one change and that's the only thing that changed over a 12 month period. Things are changing all the time. Um, so doing the best we can to try to track those changes, but then looking at different factors to see, yeah, it was great that we added, that they added more bedding more often, but maybe that higher stocking density started to, you know, push those limits on lameness um, and just keeping tabs on that, knowing that maybe they should, you know, if they're gonna be adding more cows, really take that into consideration. This example is another tie stall, um, and they've made a lot of changes over the years. So about seven years ago, they actually installed a Juno feed pusher robot. So obviously that was a huge investment, um, but the producer felt like it was the right move and and liked the, you know, the decrease in labor of having to push up the feed himself, knowing that the feed was gonna be there all the time throughout the day. Um, and then about two years ago, they renovated the barn and put in new stall dividers. They raised their tie rail and they put in new pasture mats. So this is a great example of varying degrees of investment. Um, so to redo his stalls, he did it himself. It was a lot of work, but he said it was less than 50 bucks a stall um, to get new um, stall partition and supports. And then they purchased new pasture mats. So that's obviously going to be, you know, some expense. Um, but there was varying degrees of, of investment. So this is showing um, the barn as it was getting renovated. So on the right here, that would be the old stall base and this lone steel um, partition here was what they used to have. Um, and on the left is the new pasture mats. 
and the new stall partitions. So he basically made his own freedom stalls or green stalls or whatever you want to call them um, by having steel posts with a little um, jut out that he then affixed a PVC pipe to, um, to make his stalls uh, bigger essentially. So his cows weren't hitting on this, this piece of metal here. So just for people who really like to see what we're talking about, um, this is how, you know, what his stalls look like from the front. He had moved that tie rail forward. Um, and this is a great example where he had played around with also raising it um, to meet that stall size recommendation and just found it was too high. Um, so he had to actually lower it a little bit below recommend, recommended level, um, but because he had moved it forward enough, it, it works. And then just showing it from behind the cows. So obviously here there's a trade-off. Um, some of these cows are a little bit dirtier because they have a bit more freedom, um, but he also had some big some big cows, some older cows, and it gives them the ability to lay a little bit more um, sideways, which isn't ideal, but if they don't have anywhere else to lay, um, it just gave them that freedom without having to hit any sort of hardware there um, and cause some injuries. So he, we did some, some scoring here and saw improvements in his lameness, improvements in hawk injuries, and improvements in knee injuries. Um, the, he also said that his culling got a lot better. So in his previous system, he was losing old cows just because they were getting injured and banged up. Um, his reproduction also greatly improved. His preg rate went up and he was picking up a lot more um, heats and getting cows pregnant without having to use off sync. Um, so a little bit less labor. So he said it was definitely worth the investment and the work. <coughs> Excuse me. So our fourth case study, um, this is an example of a big investment. So they had a tie stall as well as a small freestyle barn, and they were rotating the cows through. Um, so they would milk the cows in the tie stall, let those cows back to the freestall, and then move these freestall cows back to the tie stall. So very labor intensive. As you can see, this is an old, outdated tie stall barn. Um, cows were not fitting in the stalls. And his goal was to build a new freestall and parlor. So this is the new freestall. Um, stalls were a lot bigger, new mattresses. So the original assessment, um, when they were in both systems, they had a lot of, a lot of injuries. So um, a lot of hair loss and a lot of severe injuries on the hawks and knees, and their lameness was pretty high, um, especially that severe lameness at 10%. They made this change at the end of 2018. Um, so I came back about five or six months later, um, and the reassessment, there was huge improvement seen in, in hawk and knee injuries. And what's really positive is especially in those severe injuries. Um, and the same thing with lameness. You know, slight uptick in the mild lameness, but overall a big drop in that severe lameness, which is what we'd want to see. Um, so huge improvements from a cow comfort perspective. And when I um, was talking to him, I asked him, you know, with, with improvements like this and with not having to switch your cows, I would assume you saw a huge improvement in milk production. And his response was, oh my gosh, yes. And it's still improving. So they went from about... Um, 20,500 up to 24,000 and he said it's still improving. Um, they're constantly getting better, adding more bedding and really trying to maximize that new facility. So an example of a huge investment obviously, but he's still, you know, saw a huge response. Um, and as I said, he's still improving. So we just have two more to go. So in this herd, um, this is an example of a farm that assesses cow comfort on a regular basis and they're constantly making changes and, and trying to address that next problem and make those improvements. So um, through working with Novus and now with Extension, I've done cow comfort assessments here about six or seven times over the last nine years. Um, and you can see kind of the progression of, this was in 2016, 2017, and now we have 2019. They've really improved their, their bedding uh, particularly. So, um, in previous years, we looked at just the high lactation pen, um, and we could see improvements in their hawk injuries over time, big improvement overall in the hawk injuries, as well as a drop in lameness. Um, and through these years, 2010 to 2014, um, they started to work on increasing bedding, um, looking at hoof trimming frequencies, foot bath frequencies, doing it more often, um, and trying to catch those cows earlier. They also added more fans for ventilation. So again, example of not usually one thing just changes, a lot of things are changing, especially when we're looking at it over a few year period. 
And then looking at their more recent data, this was when I looked at all the milking and dry cows as part of that recent study. Um, and again, we're still seeing improvements in hawk and knee injuries and a drop in their lameness. Um, and in these more recent years, they had switched from sawdust to manure solids for bedding. Um, so they have you know, more manure solids that they can be using, so they're bedding more heavily. They also had some deflated waterbeds. Um, it was kind of a, a fluke, but they had some valves that weren't working, so they replaced those, refilled their waterbeds, um, and really focused on keeping that lying surface comfortable for those cows, um, and it definitely was paying off for them. So just a great example of a herd that constantly is looking at what can we do now to get to that next step. Then the last one is a video, um, just so you guys can hear it from, from an actual producer. We milk about 42 cows, and uh, we have another 900 cows down the road at a freestyle barn. We focus in genetics and really want to make sure that we have uh, comfortable cows that are high producers and um, that are going to last a long time in our herd. A little over a year ago, we did an assessment here with Cornell Cooperative Extension, and it made us really look at some of the things we can still improve to make our cows even more comfortable. Um, we have changed some things. We have some added some sprinklers and some fans, and are looking to adjust our tie rails so that the cows can eat and drink more freely. Oh, we've seen a lot of benefits um, with the cows lying down longer, especially at the end of the barn. Be able to see actual data to be able to make decisions because these decisions help our cows, helps our management, and ultimately uh, helps us financially. Okay, so that was an example um, of one of our Tysol farms and just talking about the improvements they made. Um, and as Jessica said, you know, they did see improvements specifically in that farm. Um, they had on average good lying time, um, but there was a few animals that were really low. Um, and instantly she was like, yeah, they're all at one end of the barn. Um, and that end of the barn did not have enough fans um, and was definitely getting hot. We did this assessment in the summer. So indicated to them, you know, on average things looked okay, but there was individual cows that, you know, had lower cow comfort than, than they would like to see. Um, so they made that change and saw improvements. So overall, summarizing everything, um, obviously our goal is to try to improve cow comfort. Um, from a cow welfare perspective, it's, you know, it is just the right thing to do as a, as a farmer to try to maximize how comfortable that cow is. We talked about the public perceptions. What does a consumer think? Um, and it is, does impact your bottom line. Um, what's promising is that in New York, we're seeing for the tie stalls and the free stalls um, data that is similar to industry benchmarks, and we are meeting some of those farm program requirements. Um, and there are definitely benefits to regular monitoring of cow comfort. So whether that's through um, your nutritionist or uh, some sort of consulting, your herd veterinarian, if you have an extension, um, utilizing the services that are available to you as a producer um, to try to monitor that cow comfort um, and get maybe a third uh, or an outsider perspective um, to come in and give you feedback. Um, and as we saw in the last few examples, producers are making changes and seeing improvements. Um, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Um, it can be small changes that still lead to an improvement in cow comfort and profitability. So thank you. That's my contact information, um, and I appreciate you guys joining us today. Well, very good. I think we're uh, uh, excellent presentation here. Abby, do you want to make some preliminary uh, uh, comments before we uh, go to the Q&A? Because we got a lot of questions to go through. I will do that. Um, thank you, Lindsay. I think you did a really great job setting up um, some of the, the standards that we should look at for cow comfort and how we can assess that in herds, the data, data that you found. And then I think, you know, most importantly, actual farms that have made changes and seen results. So thank you for setting that up for us and doing this presentation today. Um, if any of you on board want to watch the presentation, again, remember that all of our webinars are archived. Um, we've been doing these webinars since 2011, and you can find all of them on a wide array of topics, all available online, go to www.hordes.com and check out the webinar tab. You can see what we have coming up for the next two months. In September on the 9th, we'll be getting together for a presentation by Adam Locke, who is with Michigan State University. And his presentation will be titled Incorporating Cats in the Dairy Ration. And that webinar will be sponsored by Cargill. We appreciate their support for that. Then looking forward to October on the 14th, we'll have a presentation titled Employee Training Impacts on Animal Welfare. And that will be presented by Robert Hagevort 
I'm a veterinarian from New Mexico, um, the university there. So those are our next two presentations. Please mark your calendar, and we hope that you will make plans to join us. As Mike said, a number of questions came in, so we have a few of them on the slides coming up here. These are questions that were submitted prior to the webinar. Also, if you're listening to the webinars live, there's also an opportunity to type in questions. If you haven't seen that yet, you can go to the GoToWebinar control panel and look down at that questions tab, and that's where you can type in questions if you have anything else that you want to ask our speaker. So, Mike, if you want to go ahead and start with these questions that we received previously, and then go right into the questions that came in during the webinar. Very good, Abby. We do have uh, three of them that came in from our listeners before, from people who uh, were planning to attend the webinar here. So let's start these out, Lindsay. Here's your first one. Uh, what are the real, boy, the real causes of hock lesions in freestalls? Uh, can we improve by moving the neck rail and brisket rail forward a bit more? So the main cause of hock lesions, and we touched on this a little bit, it's ultimately that bedding surface. So the stall base and the amount of bedding you use. Um, we know from previous studies, deep bedded stalls, so essentially like no stall base, just a ton of bedding, that is linked to fewer hawk injuries. Um, so if you have mattresses, mats, concrete, or water beds, you're gonna see on average more hawk, injury, hawk injuries um, or hair loss on the hawks. But that can be managed through the use of bedding, so utilizing more bedding. So we see less, uh, fewer hawk injuries when there's more bedding being used. Um, there's not that I'm aware of a big link between the neck rail and hawk injuries. Um, I guess if your stall was extremely short and your cows were having to maybe lay with their legs out the back of the stall. Um, but really the main thing for hawk lesions, if you have a problem with hawk lesions is looking at the bedding surface. Um, so is it comfortable? Do you have enough bedding? Um, those would be the main things to focus on. Okay, let's move to the next one, and uh, this one comes from Pakistan. Uh, how often should we change sand in a sand-based freestalls? And then he asks also a question, uh, can sand temperature monitoring be a tool for cow comfort, especially, I'm sure, under heat stress? Yeah, so producers say different things. Usually, like if you're talking about changing sand, like fully getting rid of it, um, a lot of farms tend to do that once or twice a year, like a full scrape out of the back of the stall um, and adding fresh sand. Um, so usually that's that's done, you know, once or twice a year, depending on the herd. Um, and then fresh bedding would be added anywhere from, you know, every few days to every seven to 10 days, depending on how, how the cows utilize it. Um, in terms of looking at sand temperature, so like the bedding temperature, um, yeah, that could definitely be used, especially like you said, um, during during times of heat stress or even here in upstate New York. Um, unfortunately, with sand, we get it freezing in the winter. Um, so that's obviously not going to be super comfortable because then she's basically laying on a, a rock hard surface. So um, yes, if that sand is getting too hot, if you have direct sunlight coming through the side of the barn and hitting that, um, cows are not going to want to lay on that. So that would be a good place to to just keep your eye on as well. Okay, our third question, uh, also from Pakistan, uh, what should the sand level be in the free stall itself? Um, so also just when we talk about deep bedded stalls, it doesn't have to be sand, um, but you know, sand gets talked about as that gold standard. But if you have a stall that is full of deep bedding, um, that can work you know, just as well. Um, so with any sort of deep bedded stall, whether it's sand or not, you want that bedding to be at least at the level of the curb. So you don't want that curb to be exposed. Um, you want the bedding to basically fill that stall surface and you want it to be level. Um, and there is data from previous studies that shows that lying time will start to decrease as the bedding gets lower and more uneven. Um, so going back to managing that, that stall, keeping that bedding level and keeping the stall full. Okay, very good. Well, let's move on then to some of the other questions that came in here. Uh, in fact, this leads right into it. What are the advantages, pros, and cons of the various building and bedding materials? Sand, straw, shavings, uh, manure solids would be a good one to add as well. Any any thoughts on those comparisons of which is better or what's your, your first choice or your last choice? Yeah, so as I said, sand kind of gets considered as, as the gold standard. Um, the benefit of sand is it's inorganic. So you're, you know, assuming you've got clean sand, um, it should be a little bit better than um, 
an organic material like sawdust or straw in terms of bacteria growth. However, any bedding that you use, um, as long as it's soft and you're keeping it dry and clean and you have a good amount, can work. So if you're using sawdust, uh, if you're using manure solids, sand, straw, as long as you have a good amount of it um, and you're, you're managing it and keeping it clean and dry, that's, that's really what matters. Um, it's less important what type of bedding it is and more about how you're managing it. An interesting question, uh, and that is, what is the disadvantage of using free stalls in hot climate? And this comes from Egypt. A disadvantage of a free stall in a hot climate um, would depend on your heat abatement and ventilation of that free stall. So if you had a, a poorly designed free stall that did not have adequate ventilation and heat abatement, then, um, you know, the negative would be you're not going to get a breeze, your cows are going to get heat stressed. Um, but really the benefit of a free stall is that you have the ability to, to add extra ventilation and heat abatement. So you can put in fans, you can put in sprinklers. Um, and we know from, from uh, previous research that those things are very beneficial in keeping the cow comfortable, getting her to lay down more, helps with her milk production, her intake, her reproduction. So there really is a lot more benefits of free stalls if you can you know, utilize them to their full ability. Very good. Well, here's an interesting one, and uh, you, I think you've answered part of it, but not all of it. Is there a standard for cow comfort? And they list lying time. You had some of that listed there, walking distances, and maybe steps per day. I guess we'll have to get them a meter, and so we can count the steps, although I guess that's on the marketplace already. That comes from Israel. Um, so yes and no. Um, in terms of just an industry standard, not really. Um, if we're talking about here in the U.S., there are standards in, in the sense of, yes, if you want to ship milk to your co-op and your co-op participates in the National Farm Program, then you have to meet those standards. Um, but in terms of, you know, what is the exact standard for lying time, there is the recommendation of about 12 hours a day. Um, but we also know that not every cow needs to lay down for 12 hours a day. So I always hesitate saying, you know, this is what you should have. Um, because I've worked with herds that have, you know, 11 hours and their cows are, are very comfortable, um, high producing, good cow comfort. So I hesitate to give, you know, this is where you need to be. Um, but we have industry benchmarks that we know where we're at. And we have programs like the National Farm Program that are setting targets. Um, and we can use those benchmarks as, as examples of herds that are really um, on on the better end of things and kind of use those as a target to, to work towards, knowing that it is possible on those farms. Perhaps a related uh, question has to do with the use of rubber uh, for cows walking, especially to milking parlors and holding pens. Any thoughts on the, the role of rubber on cow comfort and uh, distances being walked? Yes, definitely. Um, cows much prefer rubber from um, compared to concrete. Um, and you'll see lots of pictures of you know, an alleyway to and from the parlor and there's just a strip of rubber and all the cows are lined up to, to utilize that rubber. So um, yes, there's definitely benefits to using rubber. You, you just have to use the right rubber. Um, sometimes it can get a little too slippery uh, if it's not grooved um, or if it's just the wrong um, composition. We do see problems with slip, slipping, um, but if it is designed properly, there are, there are benefits um, in, like I said, those high traffic areas. So to and from the parlor, um, anywhere the cows are taking sharp turns. Sometimes we see it um, along the feed bunk where the cows are gonna be standing. Um, just remembering that rubber isn't gonna solve the problems of a poorly designed stall. So, you know, worst case scenario is a herd that had very poorly designed stalls. So they put in rubber everywhere, Well, the cows just started laying down on the floor on the rubber because it was better than the stall. So, you know, it, it is a great management tool, um, but you still have to be making sure that they have a comfortable place to lay down. We actually have two questions that are related here, and they both have to do with slope. Uh, do we need to have a slope in the bedding area and the freestyle areas to stimulate uh, maybe what's on pasture or cows laying uphill? Uh, what are you, what's your thoughts on that? Um, so a lot of times, with especially with like deep bed, you do see producers kind of try to bed a little bit heavier at the front of the stall um, and slope it back, partly too, because that way the bedding you know kind of gets worked back through the stall. Um, and with mattresses, some are installed on a slight slope. I think it's usually about 2% is, is the, the recommendation. You don't want to go higher than a 2% slope. Um, we, it's pretty minimal then. Um, I don't think you need to have that slope necessarily. It would help, I think, in that case more so with a little bit of moisture. The idea would be that that would drain to the back of the stall um, and try to help keep that stall clean. 
Um, but from mimicking a pasture, I don't know how much that would be important versus just making sure it's a big enough, um, you know, soft enough, clean enough place for her to lay down. And related to that, uh, some farmers talk about it, what they call a bedding saver. They'll put in a plank or, or PCV pipe or something like that. Uh, have you seen much of that? And what's your what's your feeling on putting a, a bedding saver in the back to to maintain a little higher curb to keep that bedding or sand from moving out? Yeah, um, I've seen it done. Um, it definitely can be done. Um, I would just always make sure the producer knew what they were getting into. Um, so it depends on how high your curb already is. You don't want your curb, you know, to be 16 inches tall. Um, it's going to be really hard for especially a, a sore cow or a really old cow to get in and out of that stall. So it's going to kind of be maybe an independent um, case by case basis of of what the farm already looks like. And then recognizing too that bedding management becomes extremely important because now you're adding a more aggressive part of your stall. So if you let that bedding get down below that curb, um, now that you've added that extra, you know, wood or PVC or whatever, you've just now created an even worse part of the stall that that cow can get banged in, banged up on. Um, so just recognizing if you're going to do that, then you absolutely have to have, um, you know, the proper amount of bedding to keep that stall full of bedding so that um, you're getting the benefits of more of a deep bedded stall um, without the negative of having that higher curb. And there's been some discussion, uh, Lindsay, about not putting a brisket board in on free stalls. Have you, uh, have you have a feeling on the brisket board presence or not present? Yes. So whenever possible, and it, um, I say this because I've seen it work, try without the brisket board. Um, we know that a cow does not like a brisket board. Um, so that example there of that, of that cow, her knee is resting on that brisket board. Um, we do know that brisket boards reduce um, lying time and can cause knee injuries. So um, whenever possible, I always encourage producers to try to, um, to not use one, or if they are gonna use one, make sure it's moved far enough in the stall that we're still giving that cow adequate lying space. Um, it's not too high, so you really don't want it more than about four inches high. Um, she still should be able to extend that front leg over it. Um, it's just a natural resting position is having that front leg extended. Um, and to make sure you have adequate bedding. Um, in, in some cases with some stalls and some cows, having that brisket board does help. Um, but knowing that from a cow comfort perspective, she would prefer it not be there. Um, and I definitely have seen free stall farms that don't have them and it works just fine. Um, I always just encourage people to consider, you know, playing around with removing it and seeing what happens. Okay, uh, in regards to cow comfort, you perhaps can summarize this one. Uh, how, how to reduce the number of lameness cases, especially in the summer season? This question comes from Pakistan. Yeah, so that's, you know, a bunch of things really going to depend on on the situation. But if it's summertime, um, definitely be looking at your, your heat abatement. Um, we, especially, you know, depending on what part of the world you're at, we do kind of see spikes of lameness um, sometimes just after the summer because cows have been standing around all summer. Um, so doing what we can to make sure those cows are laying down. Um, or if you have cows that are out on pasture um, and in the summertime, maybe they're having to walk really far. So in our tie stall study, we had a couple pasture-based herds that would only come in to basically get milked in the summer. Um, and they were walking really far distances to access pasture because um, things were getting pretty dry. So if your cows are going outside, making sure the surface they're walking on um, is, is suitable and they're not walking too far um, and doing what you can to get those cows lying down more. And then looking at other things like diet and hoof trimming, foot bath frequencies, et cetera. The last question is really one for me, and that is, how long does it take to do an audit? You were talking about these audits uh, on farms. Uh, how many hours does it take to do an audit if you're doing an audit in a New York farm? Um, so it would depend on, um, so like for the freestyle ones, um, when we were doing kind of a mock farm evaluation, um, for a larger herd, we were looking at more animals and having to walk through all of the pens. Um, so for a larger herd, it would take me a good few hours um, and sometimes, you know, half a day. Um, and I, I really think in order to get a good idea of what's going on, you want to be able to walk through each pen and, and be there for at least a few hours. So, um, yeah, I guess I would say about a few hours or so if you really wanted to, you know, I then come back, um, and on that one herd where I've done a lot of assessing, I've spent, you know, a full day there lameness scoring all over the cows kind of thing. Um, so 
I would want to spend at least a few hours, but in some cases, then you have to come back and really look at things some more and spend a half day or a day there. Well, very good, Lindsay. You've answered all the questions we have here. Abby, do you want to wrap up the, the webinar for today? I will do that, Mike. Once again, thank you, Lindsay, for a great presentation and then those very thoughtful answers at the end here. Um, one of the great features about a live webinar is that we can have that interactive time and allow our speakers to answer questions, and you did a great job going through those, so thank you. We want to um, remind everyone in the audience about our upcoming webinars. Coming up on September 9th, we have the presentation by Adam Locke from Michigan State University on incorporating fats in the dairy ration, with the um, sponsor for that webinar being Cargill. Then our next webinar taking place in October will focus on employee training and how that impacts animal welfare. So please make plans to join us for those webinars. Um, finally, want to thank all of you out in the audience for listening in today. We always appreciate your attendance and we hope that you um, gathered some information that you can take home with you either to the farm or to the people that you're working with in the um, agriculture industry. So thanks again for joining us today. Until next time, I'd like to say farewell from all of us here at Hordes Dairyman Magazine and our team at the University of Illinois. Please take care, and we hope to have you on a future webinar.